Hey folks, Joseph A. Savora here. It's been a while since I've done my last movie review, which happens to be the 2014 reboot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which I already said it's one of the worst movies of the year. I actually put it on my worst list on the best and worst movies of 2014 last week, if you saw my last video. Well, yeah, could never forget that crappy movie. But I'm so glad I finally sold that Blu-ray already, because now I don't have to worry about that anymore. I finally went on to buy even more Blu-rays you know, during the holiday season, and I was really lucky. So I had to take a break from all of this so I can start watching some movies and all this other stuff and just relax, do whatever I want, and everything. And I'll continue to do more of that, so who knows. Anyway, um, just to kick out with the new year, 2015, I decided to review a classic movie that I really enjoyed since I was a kid called Big. That's right. The 1988 film about a young 12 year old kid who wants to grow up to become a 30 year old man of himself. And that's of course played by Tom Hanks right there. Who's actually dancing on the walking piano at F.E.R. Schwartz. The toy store that was in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, surprisingly enough, this was definitely one of the biggest successful films of the summer of 1988. You know, after all three of the films, Like Father, Like Son, Vice Versa, and even 18 Again, all came out, and sad to say, they all became huge flops. Yeah, basically they were doing the body switching genre of, of that generation at the time. Sort of in the, in the tradition of... of Freaky Friday in that sort of way. But it worked. I mean, this is the movie that really worked. Because it actually had the idea of what was it like if you actually have a 12-year-old who goes to a carnival and wants up going up to the fortune teller machine called Zardar Speaks and you can actually make your own wish and you finally got your wish and then suddenly you want up going up to be a 30-year-old man. And it feels like, wow, it's quite different from where you were. <laughs> yeah. And it was... It was also the second movie that uh, Gary Marshall's uh, sister, Penny Marshall, you know, who happens to be uh, best known uh, as her role in Laverne Shirley, and went on to do her directorial debut in Jep and Jack Flash, which stars Whoopi Goldberg, who already was a rising star after appearing in Steven Spielberg's film, The Color Purple. Yep, and she became very successful part of that. But she went on to do a lot of movies, including Ghost and Sister Act. Even though some of the bad films that she did, which I know includes uh, Theodore Rex, yeah, didn't met well for her. But nevertheless, she was great. Yeah, funny comedian, everything. When this movie got made, I mean, it was first written by Gary Ross and Ann Spielberg. Happens to be the sister of the director, Steven Spielberg. They were actually having some hard times trying to find another director to take over its place, to come up with of a coming-of-age film. Yeah. They try to find other actors to play that role, including Robert De Niro, which, yeah, that would have been interesting, because I would have had loved to see what Robert De Niro had to deal with by dancing on the, <laughs> the walking piano scene, which became very memorable to this day. But on the other hand, though, I, it didn't matter to me anyway, because I think Tom Hanks definitely pulled this film off. He did feel like a kid in us. Yeah, even for a 30 year old. I, yeah. <laughs> and to think, um, I am going to be turning 30 uh, this year, so. <laughs> what luck <laughs> for this film. Yeah, and it does make you feel like you want to be you know, 12 years old again. Because I was 12 years old in 1997. <laughs> I gotta say, even my life was a lot better back then. <laughs> yeah, okay. But get to the point, though, the film was a huge, successful box office blockbuster when it first came out in June 3rd and it really met well with critics and audience alike everybody wanted to 
to jump for joy for Tom Hanks's uh, brilliant performance in that role. In fact, this was the first film that actually earned him an Oscar nominee. You wouldn't believe that for yourself because this is the film that made him a star. After films like Splash and Bachelor Party and all this other stuff, even Nothing in Common, which was directed by Gary Marshall. Yeah. And I know he, he was doing other films before that called Mazes and Monsters, which I didn't care for. Yeah, it was a TV movie, by the way. Yeah. He also did Booze and Buddies and all that. So it's cool. Yeah. And quite frankly, it became one of my favorite movies as a kid. And I remember watching this you know, a lot. I had a VHS tape. I still do, by the way. And I'm just happy to finally own the Blu-ray that has all the features on there, including the extended cut, which is on the 2007 DVD release, and it's finally on this set. In fact, uh, this Blu-ray came out in 2009. I didn't buy this until just recently, <laughs> but it's good because I'm, I'm glad it took me some time to finally get this movie, hoping for the prices to go down. So I, so yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely worth watching many times. Uh, the Blu-ray looks very good too. The transfer looks very pristine, clean, and it looks like it just came out in theaters. <laughs> so yeah. And it has all tons of great extras right here, as I mentioned. Right there. Yeah, you wouldn't believe it. Lots of great features. Yeah. So they knew they had a success in their hands. And Gary Ross and Ann Spielberg, they really came up with a very successful script. And I really enjoy that. I'm just amazed that, you know, they were afraid that this movie was, was going to flop. You know, after the first three films, it didn't do so well. Even though I really did enjoy uh, Like Father, Like Son, Vice Versa, and 18 Again. Which, yeah, they all need to be on Blu-ray by now. <laughs> Yeah, I hope they do get released sooner or later, because those are great films. I mean, okay, they're not as good as, as big, but, hey, it's, it's good. Yeah, at least give it a chance. Let's get back to this film. It stars Tom Hanks, yeah, with Elizabeth Perkins, who later went on to do The Flintstones in several films in her career. Barbara Loggia, who later went on to do the film Innocent Blood, and... and been a lot of films actually yeah, in, a, in his career. Yeah, so that's great. Uh, John Hurt, who you know has been best known for his role in Home Alone and After Hours, with David Moscow playing the young version of Tom Hanks, yeah, Josh Baskin. Which, by the way, I saw the interview of him on the Blu-ray, and he does look a little bit like Kirk Cameron right there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard to believe. Jared Rustin with John Lovitz from Saturday Night Live. You know, he later went on to do a lot of stuff, including The Critic. You know, a lot of guest appearances and everything. Mercedes Rule went on to do the film The Fisher King, which she won an Oscar for that role. Yeah, and then later, Lost in Yonkers. I actually loved her in that film as Bella. Just Clark. Kimberly M. Davis, Oliver Block, Deborah Jo Rupp from the TV show That 70s Show. Yeah, she I know she did a lot of stuff later on. And Frances Fisher, who she was only in the extended cut. I know she's been in other films and in the TV show called Strange Luck from Fox back in 1995. It's written once again by Gary Ross and Ann Spielberg and is directed by Penny Marshall. So let's get right to this wonderful film. The movie begins set in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. A 12 year old boy named Josh Baskin, who's played by David Mascow, is having his childhood days of his own. He plays a computer game in his room and he hangs out with his best friend, Billy Kopetsky, who's played by Jared Rustin, which basically they do what they always do you know, during their lifetime. They play baseball, collect baseball cards, reading comic books, and actually impressing an older girl of his dreams. 
that was walking down the street. So then during that one particular weekend, Josh went to a carnival with his family, Mr. and Mrs. Baskin, along with his baby sister. Yeah, they're all played by Josh Clark and Mercedes Rule. He winds up going to all these carnival rides until seeing the same older girl that he met earlier and tries to impress her by going up on the Ferris wheel. The only problem was he was too short. So he couldn't have gone, sadly. So as a result of that, he winds up going up to a fortune teller machine called Zordar Speaks. Yeah. And once he tried out the machine, yeah, he, he winds up putting a quarter in until suddenly it wasn't working and he keeps banging on the machine until it finally works again. Um, he did find out that it was unplugged all this time and when well, he didn't even notice. And then it finally reveals his question um, upon his wish and he says, I wish I were big. So then he got his answer once the card finally reveals on the machine. He looked at the back of the card and it says, your wish is granted. So he finally got his wish that he never thought he expected it. So during that night after he fell asleep during a windy day already, you know, it causes her baby sister to be scared. Morning finally arrives and then suddenly Josh started to feel very different as he turns out that he's already growing a whole lot bigger than he, he really had imagined. So it turns out that his wish was real. So he winds up becoming a big, pretty old man who's played by, you guessed it, Tom Hanks. So since he's already been transformed into a pretty old man, he's already had outgrown his clothes, you know, he's, except his underwear, and he was trying to find some new clothes, such as the big uh, giant's uh, blue sweater, and along with his sweats, be able to get ready to leave the house. He already left outside only to uh, f discover that all the carnivals machines and even the, the fortune teller machine is gone. So when he finally went back into the house he was trying to explain his mother um, while she was already cooking breakfast for him that he isn't exactly who, who he, what he is because it turns out that he's already grown up and he's trying to explain to his mother but until all of a sudden she started screaming and scared that she thought she saw a stranger in the house yeah she claims that Josh was a stranger and he actually kidnapped his son he, in fact she even threatened him with a knife and, and about to call the police until suddenly Josh actually screamed from his life outside of the house so with that aside, he wants to go back to school to find Billy, who's already you know, just got out of uh, playing basketball. And once he got there, he was trying to reveal Billy his identity by singing a song that he and him actually know. And unfortunately, he was scared to death because he knew that he's not exactly him until they finally got used to him. So with Billy's help, he learns that it will take a couple months to find the machine again and winds up renting a flop house in St. James Hotel in New York City. And he also winds up um, obtaining a job working as a data and entry clerk at the McMillan's Toy Company. Which later he, he winds up you know, having his first day on the job and just uh, gave him his resume to the employee and and also um, once a bumping into a pretty executive named Susan Lawrence who's played by Elizabeth Perkins who later got bumped into by his boss who's the company owner of the McMillan toy company who's played by Barbara Loggia and Paul Davenport who happens to be obnoxious boyfriend and partner for Susan played by Josh Hurd yeah, and he was also a jerk as well. Yeah, things were going pretty well for him, you know, during his first day of the job. He even bumps into another company employee named Scotty, who's played by John Blovitz. 
he's making a phone call, you know, letting his mother know that he has a son and he's taking good care of it. He's not hurting him or anything like that. And that sort of speaks. He finally got his pay. You know, he's already you know renting a new apartment, a very spontaneous apartment that he ever saw, filled with toys and all this other stuff. You know, once he finally got the job, and that was before that, by the way, he wants to go into F. R. Schwartz, the toy store at Saks Avenue in New York City. You know, basically very impressed by all of his enthusiasm. You know, just playing all these toys, you know, riding around, and even playing the laser tag, you know, with another boy, and all that. You know, he finally met Mr. McMillan once again, and and he was very impressed until all of a sudden. They runs into a foot-operated electronic keyboard, you know, the walking piano, which is very famous for that scene alone. Yeah, you know, one of the best moments in movie history is when both of them were playing a duet together of two songs, "Hearts and Soul" and "Chopsticks." Yep, and the whole crowd gone wild as they finally impressed with their very fine performance. That they just did on the walking piano because that alone became very popular at at all the F. Ray of Schwartz toy stores that actually did have that piano. In fact, I used to have an F. Ray R. Schwartz at Glendo Galleria um, back in the 90s when I was very little, and I used to go to that store and actually uh, look at all the the neat toys that they have, uh, all the Nickelodeon magazines and all this other stuff, and, <laughs> and many others. And yes, they even did have the walking piano that I saw, and I actually played on it too. That's very similar to the one they had in the movie. So I really miss that store. It's just a shame that it's already gone due to uh, bankruptcy problems. However, the company still exists today. It's already being bought by Toys R Us, so they finally saved the company now. So it's only in several locations you know, across the country. So who knows? Yeah, it would be nice if they bought it back here. It would be really cool. Yeah, because they're already missing a lot of toy stores like KB Toy Store, remember? Yeah, I used to go to that store in the mall. Prior to that alone, earns Josh a promotion for a dream job by getting paid to test all the toys out so he can finally get all the stuff he wanted. So that's really cool. Because now with his largest salary, he finally... You know, added everything, you know, like the Pepsi Benny machines, the pinball machine, and all the neat stuff that he had in, in his new apartment. Yeah. And later on, he finally uh, attracts the attention of, of Susan, you know, during the, that one scene where he finally wears a, a white tuxedo. You know, they're just, you know, going to a restaurant, you know, celebrating and... And he was already going into to the food court and you know just trying out all the food, including that that small corn that he tried. And he was doing this. <laughs> yeah, it, it was the most. That that's another famous scene in the movie that I love. So then, um, when Susan finally came by and impresses uh, Josh with what he's doing, she was already feeling you know very bored and she wanted to leave. So he's not into all these business parties. Uh, so they both uh, left together by going on <laughs> on a limo, and he was just having the best time of his life, and you know, having fun and, and doing everything. And then he finally went back to uh, his place just to impress her, and, and <laughs> they got onto the trampoline, and you know, and they had a sleepover and everything. <laughs> so they had fun together. So. Since then, you know, things were going pretty well for Josh, and and Susan is already, you know, <laughs> falling in love with him during his adult life. But unfortunately, Paul is being very jealous already because now, during that business meeting that they had, where they were, they were talking about a transformer toy, which yeah, basically it's an Empire State Building transforms into a robot. And he, of course, he just says, "I don't get it." So, why would people would just why would kids would just play, you know, a building when they should be playing a bug that transforms into a robot? 
<laughs> they got his idea. So everything was going great for him until he's already having some second thoughts because apparently he wants to go back to his family again. Yeah, you know, already at his 13th birthday. Yeah, you know, that he just celebrated, even though he was already an adult. <laughs> But as a result of that, Billy was starting to feel very noticing that all that change in Josh felt very annoyed and ne neglected. So, but even suspecting that Josh had forgotten who he really was, and even worse was that he finally got a list in the mail, and then suddenly he keeps forgetting Billy and about all the importance he had. And yeah, he even uh, he even started cursing at him too as well during that one particular day you know. uh, he's already you know very important working at all all the other stuff right. so he felt like everything was just not so great as it turns out so you know he's trying his ways to finally get back to his uh, his old self again by by walking out of a business meeting that there he was going to come up with by working on a an upcoming comic book that he wanted to create and he finally went up to a machine that he never thought he would find. Yeah, at Seaport Park, during all that time, he was also uh, going on the carnival ride <laughs> with Susan, even the, the roller coaster. Well, he finally went back to the Sword Art Speaks machine and, and started to finally get his wish again by saying, I wish I was a kid again. So now, already being confronted by Susan, who's, who saw the machine, and, and the fortune he gave to Josh, he was realizing all this time that he was telling the truth. So he knew he wanted to say that, so that way, you know, he could finally get his wish to go back to seeing his family again. Only to realize that their relationship is over. So he finally got to tell Susan that the one thing about his adult life is that he wished it would not end. But she suggests that using the machine will turn herself into a little girl as a result of that. Unfortunately, she kind of declined that being a child once was enough for her. So after that, you know, they finally get an emotional goodbye, and Josh finally transforms himself into a 12-year-old boy again, and finally went back to back home and met his family, and then, and of course, the movie ends, you know, with Josh and Billy hanging out together, you know, which is very similar to the uh, the beginning of the film. And without a doubt, it's one of the best uh, body switching movies of all time. And I really enjoyed it a lot. I love all the scenes that they went into the film. It was really hilarious. In fact, I also remember another scene that I really did enjoy was when he was actually playing squash. When he was actually playing squash with, uh, with Paul. And he, <laughs> even though he didn't know how to play the game, yeah, it's basically racquetball. Yeah, you know, they were actually you know, playing it one by one and you know hitting all the shots and everything until it went over the line and and he said, "You cheated." Yeah, you you said that <laughs> the ball sh if the ball goes out of the line, it's my turn. <laughs> and he said he cheated and, and he keeps taking the ball away right from him. And he's he's racing around and and he was trying to, to get the ball back and. <laughs> And he was already beating him, not to mention he was starting to beat him up after that. So it was... <laughs> I had to admit, it was pretty funny, too, on that scene. And then all of that that went into it. And, yeah, until you feel sorry for him you know, getting beat up. Yeah, Paul was a jerk in that film. Throughout the entire film, he, he was just acting like, you know, he just doesn't care. You know, he's, he thinks Susan is... <laughs> You know, cares more about Josh than him himself. Yeah, what a dick. And um, I really did love Mr. McMillan. You know, this is this is kind of interesting for a boss of the company to actually impress uh, Josh's uh, enthusiasm because this is not something I would expect from a boss to actually really do. Because usually bosses in movies these days are often jerks, but not this boss. He was really nice. Very nice to everybody. Yeah, Robert Lozier did a good job playing that role. I mean, this was definitely his best performance. And Elizabeth Perkins, yeah, this was definitely uh, a treat for her, you know, to actually play, you know, an executive who wants to uh, 
getting into uh, Josh and and he finally gets to have all the fun that she never thought she would have. Yeah, since she was been bored to death, you know they've been sending her a lot of mail and everything and and, she, and all all this other crap she's been going for. But Tom Hanks really shines in that role as Josh Baskin, at, you know, as a 30 year old. Even though Dave Moscow was definitely a young kid, yeah, he definitely shined as well. In fact, everybody was good in this movie. Even Jared Weston as Billy. I mean, yeah, at first he started to act like like that at first, already feeling neglected and everything. But once you see it, you'll probably know how he feels. But Tom Hanks, without a doubt, this had to be one of his best performances in movie history. Yeah, and, and that alone made it up for the fact that he wound up starring in films like Forrest Gump, Philadelphia, Castaway, and even Apollo 14 for that matter. Yeah. That's why he's becoming one of the most uh, famous actors of all time. And he already and he's already one of my favorites already growing up. <laughs> because this movie is the main reason why I love Tom Hanks. Yeah, that along with Splash and, and uh, all the other films. <laughs> yeah. As mentioned. It's definitely a treat. I mean, you just never get tired of this movie. It's worth watching over and over and over again. And it never gets over. In fact, you really wish you would have a walking piano of your own. So you can play all the songs that you love. <laughs> and I also forgot to mention they did a parody of that on The Simpsons as well. Because it was the most famous scene in the movie history. And everything, yeah. So yeah, um, definitely check this movie out uh, if you haven't. It's worth a treat. And definitely buy this film on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, or whatever. And definitely s and see it for yourself because it's, it's the one film that you really wish that you were a... that makes you wish that you really were, indeed, a 12-year-old boy getting, having all the time of your life. Even if you're already grown up, I mean, you definitely want to collect all the stuff that you never thought you had. Yeah. And that's, a, and that's, of course, big. <laughs> and I really enjoyed it. But anyway, I'm going to give the film big. Bigger experience. Five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.